we know the biggie for number one, what is this consciousness thing? What is reality? We had the sense and determination that right. there was one reality that included all of the others. Just has to. Logically. Right, it just had to. And also, we probably, before we got together to work on this, had the question of how big is reality? What does it include that we don't know about? Right, exactly. And lots of people have that. And how could we or can we know? Exactly. And then there are all sorts of philosophical questions, like can we really know this thing? Is the limit in knowledge or is the limit in language? There's the limit in capability in the subject. And clearly there are things that are beyond understanding and maybe beyond all rational understanding. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's a given that you can't rule out that there are perceptions we would have if we had additional senses. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's a no-brainer. Now, if we didn't have a brain, that's a different story. But then we, over time, concluded or our understanding morphed into the belief that what we were really dealing with was consciousness. But anyway, so we had the, the question, I mean, it starts with people talking about intuition and then ESP, premonition, all of those phenomena. And, you know, a lot of people that take those seriously and they're not all involved in a conspiracy, so... Well, it was more than that. There was this intuition that things made sense and that it was really about consciousness and it was yeah. really about one reality and these things that were not dealt with as we could see or describe in daily life, in modern culture or even in the philosophy and religion that we had been exposed to. But the paranormal and the occult seemed to be talking about these things. That's right. So that's why we got interested in the paranormal and the occult. Sure. That's the first place we ran into them being anything non-material or possibly non-material being taken seriously. Right. Psychic discovery behind the Iron Curtain. Oh, I remember that. So do I. Yes, indeed. So, yes, have we answered this question what we're looking for? Yeah, pretty well. Yes. I mean, reality, I think, finally cut. Yeah, I, I think probably the starting point is the belief that things can be understood, mm -hmm. that things do make sense. That's certainly true. The belief that things can be understood. Yes, if only we could find the teaching or the teacher that yeah, would help us. When that occurred, we didn't know anything about teaching and teacher, but that basic belief in the understandability of things, which we now realize is a little too restrictive. But that taunted us all the way through. Yes, that's right. I mean, we wouldn't be in the Tarika if we didn't think that it made things more understandable. Right, and that was the whole beauty of running into the sacred doctrine, that it dealt with these things, and it did it in a coherent form. Expressed in a Western language, modern, 1940s, but yeah. Well, that was the thing that we got mostly from Gershia. Well, it's true that we had our first taste with Gershia, and then when we got to Chuan and Gainol, we said, hey. Yeah, this is it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it was Gershia for the first time that we ran into the notion of esoteric. Yes, that's true. We didn't know that word before that. And he was the first person who pointed at ancient practices and beliefs as being intelligent as referring to something. At least some of them used to be intelligent. That's an even better formulation. Even if we had trouble with them today, they used to be intelligent. Yes, that's right. Yeah. That's where we started at. That, those are the big questions. We all had all the other usual big questions, like is man inherently good, stuff like that, but never mind. Right. Those came later. Well, once we found Gurdjieff, the question is, what is man? All right. So based on our, our answer to question number one, now we can deal with question number two. What would you say to a person who wants to be a seeker but doesn't know where to start? Well, basically the question is, where are you now? Yes, I think the answer to that question is, does that seeker or potential seeker have any kind of intuition 
that you can build on. Right. And more than intuition, you know, even inarticulated, a kind of certainty. Yes, which is what we had, the certainty yes. that things somehow made sense. Right. It's like, I don't know, it's just like knowing there's gold in them our hills, because especially once we found that people were talking about that gold in funny ways. You, I mean, you, you have to know, just not hope or believe. You really have to have the intuition that there's so much more. That's right. And most people would start by saying, I believe in God, which is a great place to start. Yeah, that's simple. It's clean. And then, once you get past all the anthropomorphism that usually attributed to God, and probably if somebody is a seeker, they're already moving past that, or they would be content where they are. Right. They're only a seeker because they want something more or something different, or they want to be something that they are not now. Right. Yeah, and they're convinced that it's possible. That's the certainty part. Or convinced that reality, God, exists. If only they could learn how to know that better or more fully. Right. I mean, the question, what does it mean to have a relationship with God? Or there must be more to prayer than I think. Yes, there but, must be more to prayer than a wish list. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so I know this is that. So what would you say... I guess the first question is, what are you seeking? Well, you know, I'm What's not sure... what you've got? I'm not sure a lot of people would be able to answer that question it from a matter. cold start. It doesn't matter. That's still the first place you have to go, that the seeker has to go. If yes. you have some vague idea, but you need to start trying to express what it is. Right. But not a bad formulation. Somewhere between those two is where most people are. <laughs> I mean, most seekers are. Right. Yeah, so the question for the seeker is, what are you dissatisfied with? What do you want? What is it you think you're seeking? Yeah, I mean, if you can't say outright, how would you begin indicating in some fashion what it is? I mean, obviously you're seeking what's missing. So what's missing is a good place to start for what you're seeking. But we don't have to really lay out the technique for interrogating. No, 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 no. The question was asked, and it's not a bad question. No, it's not. So the next question is, if someone isn't even sure that God exists, would you recommend praying to him? Not immediately. Yes, you have to make that transition between what is it that you're seeking and what he is. And how to approach it. Praying is a way to approach it. It's being interactive with it, as it were. Before you engage with it, you kind of need to figure out, well, you don't have to figure out the exists, but you have to be willing to, you have to be a scientist, you have to be willing to do experiments. Yes, well said. The question is typically about prayer, then you try to ascertain the person's understanding of prayer. And if you can Boy, I don't think I really knew much about prayer at all. Yeah, well, I didn't either. I mean, Gershiev gave a hint that it was more than... That's right. That's where that first hint came from. But yeah, I wouldn't tell somebody that wasn't sure that they should pray. I mean, when it gets to doing experiments, if the person has a question about prayer, then you can ask them about their experience with it. And are they willing to do additional experiments with it? Learn about it and then decide whether or not they want to do it? Because you really don't... I mean, if you look at the direct path, you don't need to pray. But part of the attitude you need to have doesn't rule it out. Right. In fact, it may even add dimensions to it. Sure. Yeah. So if you pray, you already, in a certain, you already have a relationship with the divine. It may not be a satisfying one. But if you're talking to it, it's a shit to it. Yes, right. And you may have a relationship to it without intercessionary or petitionary prayer, but that would be individual and have to be expressed by the person being related to nature. So, I guess that goes back to what are you looking for? What would you recommend someone to? And that's the next question. Any books to recommend for an absolute beginner who hasn't even found a path? In most cases, yes, but it still depends. It depends very much. It depends very much on their understanding and their orientation and their background and what it is they think they want to learn, gain, be in the process. Right. I mean, 
Think about the various approaches that are available within Zen. Yes, that's a good way to look at it. There are some that seem to be completely contemplative, and there are others that seem to be completely Action, engaging in practice. Yes, right. Yeah, I mean martial arts. Right, the archery. Right, archery is a little more contemplative. Yes, that's right. It is. But it really depends. Are you man number one, two, or three? Is your primary orientation physical? Is it emotional? Is it intellectual? Right, and those various types dictate or tend to dictate the kinds of path or process、right. that will be beneficial. Right, it might determine their entry point. That's a better term. Yes, it might determine their entry point, and that's what happened to us because our approach was intellectual, and we couldn't have been satisfied with anything that was simply a practice or, for that matter, a belief. Well, yeah, we had to. Understand intellectually well enough to understand that other things were needed. Precisely,、and、as it almost always is the case, get、so、to the end of the line before you. Before you <laughs> that's right. Those other things that we needed, but didn't know because we were so focused on the intellectual. Yeah, sure. We didn't、and、know about love and service and action. You、yeah, like that? There are people that are oriented that way. Who, for a time, feel like that's sufficient, and for some, maybe it's so certainly it. Absolutely. So I think Deeker needs to avoid a certain amount of disillusion. Yes. Well, I think that goes with the seeking something because one needs something.、Uh, one is insufficient or、uh, disappointed. Right. Well, and you might meet somebody who's seeking. Uh, if I just keep doing more extreme sports, I'm sure that reality will unveil itself, or I will find my answer. Right.、Uh, and you know, if the person has some depth, you could still point them to something that starts with action. Yes, and one would certainly do that. Or you could say, control of the will, control of the passion, which is a,、uh, I mean, will. That's really man. So maybe to actually answer the question, it would be that a seeker needs to understand his orientation and look for a teaching, a path, a process, a teacher that resonates with that orientation. Well, I think if the person, if the seeker, if the person the seeker is asking something of, that they need to help the person figure that out. Because one person may come oriented to faith and love and. They just want help pursuing that more. In which case, you point that person to deeper and deeper things relating to that approach. On the other hand, somebody may have been on that path for a long time. They're beginning to sense that、uh-huh. it's not enough. And yet again, there are times when, I'm speaking as a teacher, you need to say to somebody, "I can't give you what you want,、well, you know, because of your orientation. I don't have those tools." Yeah, absolutely. You have to realize that there may be a sincere seeker that you can't help, right? Or that would be better elsewhere. And that goes back to the nature of the seeker and the nature of the path, which have to, to some degree, match. Right. I mean, there are people for whom it would be just excellent to point to some of the early church fathers and suggest that, and talk to them a little bit about ritual symbolism, and send them off to an Orthodox church. To get a taste and come back and report what they think, and if they don't react too strongly against it, I mean, if they have easily addressable questions, then、mm-hmm. you can encourage them to continue there and say, "Feel free to stop in any time." Yeah, exactly. And you could even in Bloomington, you could say, "If you run across a person named Daryl Jones at that church, you'd probably ask him some questions." Right. You think. Yeah, it's a shame that there isn't something like Angie's list for spiritual teachers. I mean, ideally, one would have enough familiarity with other possibilities that might be open to somebody. It's simply to say, well, sounds like you may be a little bit oriented in this direction. Why don't you go talk to, you know, Brother Jim? Why don't you go talk to such and such an Orthodox priest? In some cases, a Catholic. Right, it's great if you can do that. It also gives you, a, you can have, if you're familiar with what some of these people are doing, then you can say, well, maybe you ought to see what so and so is saying. 
that might appeal to you. Like, what's his name, Roar or Rorty or? Well, there's a Roar and a Rorty. All right. Well, anyway, there's some Catholics that yeah. good. We parenthetically, I might add, were really unknown at the time of our seeking. That's right. Because we had so many spiritual seeking friends who had gone to their priests and asked about the prayer of the heart or the interior life. It got nowhere. So that that word did he or is her at the time? Well, we didn't know about him. Yes, clearly one had gone to Mount Athos. Well, I know the, now I can't remember his name, but there was a guy who was, I don't know how long he said to him, that he had given speeches. I think he's dead now. But he gave a whole lot of really exciting questions. He, he really had people question themselves about whether they were, did they really love God? And did they really want to do it? Well, do you really want to love your neighbor? What if he hits you over the head? Yeah, that's right. Do you really want to love your neighbor? Yeah, exactly. I mean, he was really good. I stayed up to the stuff. I can't remember his name. But I enjoyed his mentally for a little while. Anyway, we only knew what we knew. Yeah, we only knew what we knew. And we looked pretty hard. Well, we thought we did. Well, that's right. We we that's fair enough. We thought yeah. we did. And in a certain sense, we did look hard enough because we actually found something. Hard enough? Well... But the question asks, are there any books you would recommend for an absolute beginner who hasn't even found a path yet? Well, yeah, there are a lot of books one might recommend, but they vary dramatically depending on the particular seeker. And they range from Sister Consolata on one hand to Black Elk on the other. Yeah, but you know, for someone who isn't even sure if God exists, Mr. God is a Oh, it's almost too much for people. It's an Maybe. excellent place to start it. I she agree. asked some questions that are about what you think about God that a lot of people have probably had. Yes, I'm sure that's right. And she answers them eloquently. Like, Does God have a bum? That's right. Mr. Gotti <laughs> had no bum. And then there's no, conclusion is no, and they come down the street saying, Mr. Gotti got no bum? Yes, that's right. That's right, exactly. That book, I might add, I only give to friends who I think can really handle the esoteric. I mean, it's what it is. I don't know if I've ever recommended that. I mean, she doesn't have to finish it. She didn't like it, she didn't like it. But it's such a major book, really. In my path and uh, several other... Yeah, oh yeah, it's for me. And it's fascinating because it's a book you'd never pick up on title alone. No, absolutely not. It's actually one, you know, you feel like you could order a crate of and have it sent to churches. Area. Yes, you could do that. But as I said, for the churches in the area, it's kind of a feel-good book. But for those of us... Yes, exactly. We could read it, and one, maybe, would say, Wow, Mr. God is a lot bigger than I thought. He must have a big bum. Yes, precisely. Yeah, so there are people out there who, if they run into the right thing, something will light up inside, some corresponding part of themselves. Yes, and that's really the answer to this question about matching that. If you can help somebody, there are any number of sources. The question is, which is the right one? And that's why this is an art, not a science. Right. I mean, you can ask somebody, read the cave allegory, and come back and say, well, what did you think? If it didn't make any sense, then maybe they should read an emotional Christian book of some kind. or a, Maybe something from Buddhism. Bhagavad Gita would be good. That would be a good choice. Because it does address one problem. All right, shall we go on to another question? Well, see, number four is about books where people haven't found a path yet. That's kind of the... I think that's sort of the well, same. That's, that's, what we've that's what we've been talking about. Busyness and distractions. Yeah, busyness and distractions. I would simply ask somebody whose intention is it? Are you down to the next question? No, but I see that that works in the next question. But distraction is all about... It. It's do all about attention. Exactly. And it's not you need to have perfect mastery over your attention. It's that you need to investigate it and through your own experience have some idea what keeps you from holding your attention somewhere. Or, in fact, is it your attention only following your own design? Is it giving you what you want and you don't realize it? Interesting question. I'd say with busyness, you can ask the question of how can you do if you can't not do? And distractions, I talk about attention. Right. I personally would start there. 
because I feel they're direct experiential entry points. Right. This might be a good question, as is the last one for one of the weekly question and answers. Yeah, that's what I thought when I got to number seven. Yeah, I'm sort of eager to do that one. Well, you already somewhat answered something in that direction. You answered something about the bad mood. Yeah, well, I think I can dilate on this one a little. Oh, sure. I think you can. But back to paying attention. Why is it so important to pay attention to what could be gained by that? Isn't it better just to ignore things around you so you can concentrate on the spiritual things? Well, if you're concentrating on the spiritual things, aren't you saying that it's important to pay attention to it? Right, that's clearly what you're doing, is paying right. attention to the spiritual things. Right, so it's important to be able to have something to say about your attention, otherwise you won't be able to keep it on the spiritual or anything else. Right, but there's also in here an opportunity to bring one attention that might one might have on spiritual things into the attention one pays to other things. Well, that's true. The question is, is the attention on the thing or the experience? Oh, good question. That's exactly right. And the important thing is to get the attention on the experience. Yes, and if your attention is on the experience, you are paying attention. Well, yes, I mean, yeah. You're, you need to investigate at that point exactly what you have your attention on in the experience. Are you just listening to the voices in your head? Are you just feeling the sensations in your body? What is it that tells you about your experience? Anyway, yeah, there's a lot you can do, but everything ends up finally by interrogating experience. Yes because that's consciousness. Our experience of consciousness is experience. Right. These are good questions to be asked because we actually have to think about actually fielding questions. Yes, precisely. That's certainly true. So that puts the human being into the picture because otherwise it's theoretical or hypothetical. Yeah, it, it makes it personal and operative mm -hmm. rather than being conceptual and theoretical. Yes, and somewhere in here, we need to explain that path is not about having the right answer. Well, yeah, I'm thinking about the observation that there are two kinds of people, the people who want to understand, the people who want the right answer. Yes, that's right. I agree. And I came up with that formulation relatively recently, but hadn't we already noticed that? Oh, yes, you just formulated it very well, but it's it's clearly a phenomenon. Don't you think that almost anybody would relate to that? Everybody's run into opinionated people. I mean, I realize they're one of them too, but they see it in action. Right. And I think that formulation should appeal to most people. Because it's a pretty clear distinction that something you've yeah. certainly run into it's a lot. Simple and direct. But something that could be referred to somewhere in the story, I mean, it might connect with something else that's being said in the story, and might be, that might be a good place to put that observation. No, no, it's important, I agree. And that's the first question that you want to ask of the seeker. <laughs> now, what is that question? Do you want to understand, or you want to oh. Well, they might not be able to give you the answer to that question, because to parse that question properly really requires some understanding. Yeah, but I think most people, by the time they get around to thinking they're a seeker, yeah. You know, probably noticed that distinction. Yeah, maybe so. Maybe never put it into words, but you run into it all the time. Well, yeah, and similarly, you run into a lot of people who have a lot of answers. Yeah, exactly. Well, you could ask the question. Are you looking for somebody who has the answers? Or are you looking for someone to help you understand? You could put the duality on yourself. That's pretty good. <laughs>